4. The Teaching Story, Part 1 People who speak little need only half a brain. Italian proverb. I can think of no better way of beginning a consideration of stories than with a very short, true story about the situation, the real intricacies, of dealing not only with stories, but with the talking and hearing process itself. I was giving a lecture recently on the difficulty which people have in taking things in, especially at any speed, even if they do it sequentially, and how a story, or even a statement, might become a person's possession, as it were, so that it could be recalled to mind and considered from various points of view. It has been noticed, I continued, that much information is not absorbed because many people cannot really absorb something when they have heard it only once. Immediately a hand went up, and someone sitting in the front row asked me, Would you mind saying that again? I later inquired and found out that he was neither hard of hearing nor a quick-witted humorist. This time lag between the presentation of materials and their integration into the thinking and repertoire of action of the individual has itself to be taught, we find, to quite a lot of people interested in stories. It is useful to other people too, but we find it easy to observe and to test in the storytelling and story-hearing atmosphere. The holistic mode will obtain certain parts, and the more literal, others. Neither will perceive many dimensions until a skill has been developed. This short Sufi tale is employed for the educational purpose of establishing in the mind the contention, at least, that one may need this time-lapse for this purpose, and it is not intended to make fun of any of the fictional figures appearing in it. Time and Pomegranates a disciple went to the house of a Sufi physician and asked to become an apprentice in the art of medicine. You are impatient, said the doctor, and so you will fail to observe things which you will need to learn. But the young man pleaded, and the Sufi agreed to accept him. After some years, the youth felt that he could exercise some of the skills which he had learned. One day, a man was walking towards the house, and the doctor, looking at him from a distance, said, That man is ill. He needs pomegranates. Oh, you have made the diagnosis. Let me prescribe for him, and I will have done half the work, said the student. Very well, said the teacher, providing that you remember that action should also be looked at as illustration. As soon as the patient arrived at the doorstep, the student brought him in and said, You are ill. Take pomegranates. Pomegranates? shouted the patient. Pomegranates to you! Nonsense! And he went away. The young man asked his master what the meaning of the interchange had been. I will illustrate it the next time we get a similar case, said the Sufi. Shortly afterwards, the two were sitting outside the house, when the master looked up briefly and saw a man approaching. Here is an illustration for you, a man who needs pomegranates, he said. The patient was brought in, and the doctor said to him, You are a difficult and intricate case, I can see that. Let me see. Uh, yes, you need a special diet. Mm. This must be composed of something round, with, with small sacks inside it, naturally occurring. An orange? No, that would be the wrong colour. Lemons are too acidic. Ah! I have it. Pomegranates. The patient went away, delighted and grateful. But master, said the student, why did you not say pomegranates straight away? Because, said the Sufi, he needed time as well as pomegranates. Now this tale usually produces some laughter, but sometimes, especially in cultures where people have acquired the habit of turning as many things as possible into wisecracks, we occasionally get such comments as, That patient was a real idiot, wasn't he? Abolition of Impact 
The abolition of the impact of a story or other stimulus is, of course, well known as a device, a way of avoiding the assimilation of its point, and this behaviour can frequently be seen in people who have the need, displayed too in other ways, of protecting themselves against outside influences. Other tales are used as a corrective to this, enabling people to laugh at themselves or to recognise that there is no sin in being prone to the same deficiencies as very many other people are. I have come across very few reactions as dramatic as the one which followed my first publication, in 1969, of an ancient narrative about dramatic reactions. In something like 1,500 words, well spaced out and occupying nine pages with plenty of white space, I retold the legend of the man who had a very big book with only a few words written in it, the words being concerned with how people judged by appearances and confused the container with the content, as it were, and were enraged when they found that this book had so few words in it. These nine pages were printed and published as a book, with some 300 other blank pages to bulk it out. The external shape, size and weight of this volume, which I entitled The Book of the Book, presumably gave the impression that it had words right the way through, was filled with words, and the cover was gold embossed. There was an immediate outcry. Reviewers, seeing that it had only nine pages of print, manifested their rage and disappointment at such a product. None of them, at first, noticed that it was a book about people who were seized by rage and disappointment when a book turned out to have nothing in it except something about people who were annoyed when they found that a book only warned about the container and the content. Presently, however, one by one, other reviewers started to see the point and to give it good reviews. It has now run through four editions, but not before an expert at the British Museum in London unhesitatingly declared that it was not a book at all, until we found a book which proved that it really did fulfil the criteria of a book laid down by UNESCO. Now and again I see references to it as causing a sensation or as experimental and new, even in the London Times. The confusion of the container and the content, of course, is a very common human tendency, causing the worship of externals and producing magic wand-type thinking, but for some reason called cargo cultism only when it is found among underdeveloped peoples. The argument and illustration that there are these two modes, the inner and the outer shape, by means of stories such as this, makes it possible for the student to recall and replay, as it were, the model story and then to study his own behaviour to see whether, perhaps, he is developing a tendency towards superficiality, magical thinking, or incomplete attention. Analogical Teaching Sufi analogical teaching has an interesting dimension which, as one becomes more familiar with it, can be observed almost everywhere. This is summed up in the statement that things which have a mental form also have a physical one, and also a form reflected in social happenings. If the container is the human being, the content may be called the nature and quality of his inner self, whether you call this psychological, educational or spiritual. Sometimes you can see the literal disparity between container and content displayed almost as a moral lesson or even as a social drama in real life. This is what gives teaching stories their reality and also endows teaching narratives, accounts of contacts between teachers and learners, their vitality. Here is an example of how the human neglectfulness of container and content in the inner sense can actually concretize itself in a real-life occurrence. Last year, the London Times reported that one local authority in a British county had received a parcel on which they had to pay a heavy excess postage charge, since it bore no stamp. It was so badly packed that it had burst open in transit. Inside this interesting package, this container with such a disastrously negligent outwardness, what do you think there was? Nothing less 
than 200 leaflets from the Post Office Users' Council. They were entitled, Have You a Complaint About the Post Office? Here is another one, picked almost at random, which raises even deeper questions about container and content. Nutrition from the Container Four years ago, it was stated that scientific tests had been carried out on the characteristics of various breakfast cereals and their containers. Rats were fed, in laboratory conditions, on diets of both the contents and the containers. The results indicate, and I quote, that the box cardboard is often more nutritious than the cereals inside. I would draw a lesson from these instances to warn against assumptions about what one puts in, in imagined Sufi study, and what is really there, let alone what one puts it into. When people have in fact become attached to externals, stories, often jokes, can be used to enable them to acquire a more constructive perspective. In Sufi circles, it is not uncommon for a Sufi to prevent attachment to himself from the students and to draw attention to the total phenomenon of the Sufi enterprise instead. We can take a story such as this one to impart the shock which takes concentration off superficialities or irrelevancies, so that it may attach itself to something more fundamental, if less palpable. Innermost Feelings Now here is a Western story, but it will serve for this purpose. There was once a man who travelled to a far distant land to seek spiritual enlightenment. Finally, he arrived at the dwelling of a sage who was reputed to be a master of secrets. At the precise moment that he was ushered into the presence of the Great One, a strange agitation seized him, and he fell onto the ground, feeling that the very earth might open up and swallow him. At last, at last, he stammered, you have stirred my innermost being, master of spiritual exaltation. I am afraid I do not quite understand, said the venerable teacher, how you can imagine that you can benefit from what was, in fact, only an earthquake. We have a lot of them around here, you know. It should be remembered that Sufi educational technique aims at removing, or helping to remove, superficial behaviour pattern barriers to deeper understanding. This is because the concept of the exclusion of limiting factors is every bit as important among the Sufis as the inclusion of concepts and the use of special techniques for stimulating perceptions. Indeed, the former must precede the latter. Because most people will tend to adopt the outer practices of people and institutions which they respect or admire, many Sufi tales provide humorous or semi-humorous formats which can be recalled to mind to reduce this incrustation's effect in such cases. Most of the Sufi and other spiritual schools publicly known, whether here or elsewhere, are visibly, and for the Sufi, effectively, disabled in their learning potential by exactly this accretion problem. There is a tale which covers this, though it, like many other Sufi stories, also carries other dimensions which come to light when the consciousness is able to deal with them. Stealing Advice A man once applied to a Sufi to become his disciple, but was rejected, as not being ready for this path. So he decided that he would learn what he could by direct methods. What could be wrong in adopting Sufi practice? Finding out that a new disciple was being enrolled that evening, he climbed onto the roof of the Sufi meeting place and listened to the first instructions being given by the teacher. Do not walk on the left-hand side of a street. Do not avoid a fortunate person. Do not push yourself forward before others. Well, that seemed easy enough to the eavesdropper, who naturally at once proceeded to apply these teachings to his own life. But as he was walking home along the right-hand side of a street, a pot plant fell on him from a balcony and he was injured. Making friends with a prosperous merchant, all that happened was that the man swindled him. 
Finally, when he tried to apply for employment to feed himself, as he had lost all his money, he found that there were always other applicants there first, and without pushing, he was unable even to obtain an interview. Now, the tale continues, did he realise that the instructions were prescribed only for the man whom the Sufi had been talking to? Certainly not. He concluded that the Sufi was a fraud, even an agent of the devil. And of course, it was because he was not yet ready for calculated, measured instructions that the Sufi had rejected his candidature in the first place. These story structures, in addition to displaying common features of human action, have two major functions. The first is to provide indications of the barriers to learning. The second is to place in the hands of the student the means to administer, to some degree, self-correction through feedback. These tales are used instead of community disciplines because Sufis do not organise into monastic or other orders in which people are conditioned. The reason for this, of course, is that Sufis hold that such training may become another form of straitjacket and tends to produce automatism and conditioned response behaviour. Removing the element of choice in thought and action, which is only available when the alternatives are known and the conditioning does not impose a certain so-called choice. The Sufi orders, known to history, are late elaborations of the externals of schools. Although many of these so-called orders are named after their putative founders, they are later developments. Even historical research concurs in general with authentic contemporary Sufi teaching that there is neither proof nor reason for great teachers of the past actually organising such restrictive institutions. Indeed, it would make nonsense of much of their teaching if they did. Like any other instruments, Sufi tales can be misused, and when, as is not infrequently true, both the supposed teacher, who tries to apply the stories from, say, books and is not himself a product of them, and the would-be learner, are not operating within the real Sufi frame, nothing useful will happen at all. Unless you call propaganda or emotional stimulus useful, and you can get those anywhere. The Symptoms the following passage indicates one side of the situation which then obtains. Someone asked a wise man, I have heard that humanity is suffering from an ailment which prevents men and women from seeing truth, from knowing themselves. What is the main symptom? He answered, The first symptom is to believe that one is not suffering from this illness at all. But when it really starts to take hold, the patient may agree that he is ill, but now insists that the disease is anything other than actually it is. This disordered perception is very marked in heroic but ill-considered attempts at obtaining esoteric knowledge, which really means simultaneous knowledge, all over the world today. Sufi teaching takes place within a system which is much more often than not indirect. It is sometimes unperceived at the moment of its operation, though not always in its externals. The 13th century teacher Jalaluddin Rumi refers to this indirect operational quality of stories, which one often observes in action, through an actual tale, a tale explaining how a tale can work. There was once a merchant who kept a parrot imprisoned in a cage. When about to visit India on a business trip, he said to the bird, I am travelling to your homeland. Can I give any message to your relatives there? Simply tell them, said the parrot, that I am living here in a cage. When the merchant returned, he said to the parrot, I am sorry to have to tell you that when I found and informed your wild relatives in the jungle that you were caged, the shock was too much for one of them. As soon as he heard the news, he dropped from his branch, no doubt having died from grief. Immediately he had spoken, the parrot collapsed and lay inert on the floor of his cage. Sorrowfully, the merchant took him and placed him outside in the garden. Then the parrot, having got the message, sat up and flew away out of reach. 
we must not think either that this exhausts the symbolism of this story or that it will necessarily appeal to everyone. Rumi himself once said that counterfeit gold is only to be found because there is such a thing as real gold to be copied. And there is a true story of something which took place in Britain not so long ago, which verifies our experience that many of our stories, and especially the events in them, appear on the surface to be so trivial to so many people that they reject them completely. A jeweller in Birkenhead, Cheshire, in England, wanted to get people into his shop. He handed out 3,000 stones to people in the street. They all looked like real diamonds, but all but four of them were glass. He explained, in a leaflet given to each recipient, that there were real diamonds among the giveaway stones. Whoever got a stone of any kind was invited to visit the jewellery store to find out if they had been lucky. Out of the 3,000 people getting the stones, only one, a woman, actually turned up at the shop. She was right, she had a genuine diamond. All the rest of the people, presumably, thought that they were all fakes. The real diamonds had been as quickly discarded as the spurious. Now, if this kind of thing can happen with things as concrete as stones, and if people are, in general, as neglectful of possibilities as to provide only one individual in 3,000 to have hope for success, you can see an instant analogy with our own experience. The analogy includes the minus factors that people can call us fakes for peddling silly old stories and refuse to seek further. It also carries with it, however, the plus that enough people think that we are harmless peddlers of old stories to allow us to continue on our way. Both the Quran in the 7th century and the writings of Rumi in the 13th, and many other books, have been opposed by wiseacres and the wise on exactly the grounds that they were just filled with old fables, which could not possibly be of any use to anyone. So we remain in respectable company. But even fables, stories of less deep outer messages than that of indirect teaching, can be used, and are widely used, to accustom even quite small children to the future realities of life in the Middle East and Central Asia, the heartland of my basic culture. But you do not have to be a child to accept or to reject stories as vehicles for psychological action or knowledge. When someone asked me on BBC Radio once why I used so many of other people's tales and did not make up any of my own, I said that nobody had asked me for my own. So the interviewer, of course, immediately asked me to tell an original one, which I did. A friend of mine had the radio on in his office at the time and asked his secretary what she thought of it. She said, No wonder nobody ever asks him. His stories are terrible. But the main reason to adopt traditional tales is, of course, that you don't try to manufacture your own instrument if you already have a range of them, superbly made and totally effective, fashioned by master craftsmen. From the Sufi understanding of human thinking, of course, the secretary could hardly be expected to rave about a story if she had other priorities on her mind. It is never easy to get publishers, for instance, to publish collections of Sufi tales if they first see the manuscript and judge that they are of what they call uneven quality. Judging the tales for punch, humour, interest, or whether they say anything to you at a given moment, is using the stories in a way in which they are not intended to be used. An instrument is useful or not, according to whether the circumstances are correct. The Camel Man and the Plastic there is a true tale about this. I once showed a piece of clear plastic to a camel man. He looked at it and said, Interesting, but there is no future in it. I asked him why. Well, he said, It is not sufficiently transparent to see through properly. It is probably very costly. You can't wear it, and it would not keep the glare out if I used it for a window in a tent. One great advantage of Sufi tales and narratives of encounters which I see, but which many others find irksome, 
is that they help to make real to the mind the fact that everything has its own correct time. Now this is a part of our daily experience. You cannot catch a train if it is not there, for instance, apart from all the other prerequisites needed to get on that train. But people tend to imagine that this sort of argument is always advanced to stop someone doing something, or to avoid having to do it. It is Sufi experience that people who can keep calm enough to realise that there might be a time and a place and other requirements for anything are more, not less, able to benefit from that thing. Here is a story which is almost always taken to mean that certain things are impossible, but which need not mean that at all. Fish out of water a would-be disciple begged a Sufi master to teach him exercises. The Sufi, however, said, I am going to tell you a story instead, then you won't need exercises. He continued, There was once a man who agreed to train a fish who begged him to help, to live out of the water, being desperate to take up a life on land. Little by little, a few seconds and then a few minutes, then hours at a time, he managed to get it accustomed to the open air. In fact, the fish went to live near him, with its own damp but open-air place in a flowerbed in the man's garden. It was delighted with its new life, and often used to say to him, This is what I call real living. Then one day there was a very heavy downpour of rain, which flooded the garden, and the fish was drowned. It makes a good laugh and it can sound like a derisive tale, but the story only refers to fish, and as it is a story, fish does not have to be an unalterable condition of the person being told it. The usefulness of the teaching story is boundless under the right conditions, though severely limited under two circumstances. The first of these, of course, is when people think of stories as trivial, and only belonging to entertainment or for the inculcation of morals and so on, as in the current versions of the fables of Aesop. Even if they are seen to show up amusing sides of human nature, this usage, this opinion about them, blunts their impact. So we can never be confident about the opportuneness until some context has been given about the traditional importance of the story to enable our hearers to reacquire flexibility of mental approach. The other limiting circumstances is when people have, for some reason, become so bemused by an attitude of awe and a desire for amazing secrets that they are, effectively, consuming that experience, the experience of awe, and get turned on, amazed and bemused by the story itself. It is generally felt that these two attitudes are linked with the individual's desire to define exactly what the story phenomenon is, ahead of his willingness to have explained to him that it is a subtle and very sophisticated instrument. Such attitudes, incidentally, may betray the underlying motivation of the individual concerned as being a thirst for either order or excitement. Is it, we may ask, a desire for knowledge or self-development? We seldom find it wise to dissolve this fixation of choice, as it might be called, since the result usually is someone who may not now be fixated on an erroneous expectation from stories, but still has the desire for, say, explanations or emotional stimulus. The reduction of basic psychological balance is not the main job of the Sufi, who is always, moreover, aware of the significance of the saying, before killing the cat, make arrangements about the mice. Teaching stories do serve as correctives for various psychological conditions, though they are not primarily employed as a therapy, but rather as an illustration of what people are really like. The therapeutic effect, if any, would take place as a part of the entire operation of involvement in the tradition. This is seen as a harmonization and not a treatment. The symptoms disappear, that is to say, when the ailment is not commanding a portion of the student's attention, which is extended for other purposes. 
The aim to provide the attention capacity with fruitful objects of attention does not treat the symptoms and does not treat the disease. The disease ceases to exist when the whole being is harmoniously balanced. It is not regarded as a therapeutic process because the intention is not to cure and the procedures are not aimed at the ailment or to make the person feel better or even to operate better on the ordinary psychological plane. The restoration of the harmony of the individual has, it is believed, higher aims than that, of which a byproduct should be the vanishing of the disability. When a real interest takes over, psychological troubles are remarkably often exercised by it, a sort of reverse of the proverb, when the house catches fire, the toothache flies out of the window. This is more than a theory seen from the Sufi perspective. For the learning system, including the use of stories, is both primary and also the same element as has produced the Sufi exponent himself. The teaching is hence not exterior to the practice, and our kind of study is therefore participation activity. It is not objective in the sense that we can have, say, gardeners who never touch a plant, or experts on government who teach it but have never been near a government let alone having discharged any functions connected therewith. The motivation to study Sufism, or even to familiarise oneself with any of the system's procedures, will, according to the Sufis, only yield results to the extent to which the field as a whole has truly been entered into. Students at a distance will always, of course, continue to obtain what they can from this and all other kinds of study. But the bits and pieces which can be obtained by this method will probably be produced by many other methods, including much more respectable scientific ones, given enough time. There is a short tale which emphasises the value of knowing what one is aiming for. What he was trying to do. A man went to a Sufi and said, My neighbour makes my life a misery by visiting me at all hours hanging about my house and constantly asking questions. The Sufi advised, Nothing is easier than the cure for this. All you have to do is to ask the man for money every time you see him, and he will soon start to avoid you. But supposing he then goes about the town telling everyone that I am a beggar? Ah, said the wise man, I see that you are hoping to control the thoughts of mankind not trying to stop your neighbour annoying you. Do you often imagine that you want one thing when you really want another? The Sufi teaching story, above all, does not require anyone to dress in comic clothes or adopt a peculiar attitude towards anyone or anything. It expects people to enlarge their horizons, but it has to have its own requirements fulfilled in order to operate to an appropriate degree. The introduction of this material into the West attracts all kinds of expectations, and some of them will undoubtedly produce hybrid results which could be absurd. Like all other forms of learning, it needs its own basic teaching institution, and that is not a do-it-yourself one. Someone engaged in self-study, runs the proverb, should not have a fool for a teacher. One story which is current in the West can be used to illustrate what I mean. Doing your own thing. A man once crossed a carrier pigeon with a parrot so that its offspring could speak its message instead of having to carry a written one. But the bird which was produced by this experiment took hours instead of minutes to finish its journey. Why did it take you so long? the man asked it. Well, it was such a beautiful day, said the superior bird, that I walked. This is why you have Aesop and wise saws instead of developmental instruments. You choose the inculcation of morals alone, or mainly so. One can't help thinking of this story today when people mix all sorts of techniques and exercises in trying for spiritual realisation. Their results are as mixed up as the bird in the fable. The results of such hybridising experiments can be long-lasting, Many are to be found in the East, 
and persist as circuses whose participants, generally, dislike stories and really do fear humour. They call themselves spiritual, however. And since we are talking about tales from the East, we can invoke a slightly different angle on the same subject, that this is an intact tradition with its own requirements. The stories belong to a whole spectrum of reality, they do not mix with cults and bits and pieces. Rather roughly, for the sensibilities of some of the delightful people who are perhaps accustomed to gentler treatment, I take the liberty of quoting a traditional saying often used by people less polished than you or I. If you have been asleep in a kennel, do not ask why you get up in the morning covered with fleas. It is important, at the very least, to familiarise oneself with the whole available range of stories put out in this manner, for they are to be considered the facets of a whole. And in addition, the individual story must be given close attention, so that it can yield its optimum value. To go from one to another choosing those which appeal, and giving no attention to those which do not stimulate us so much, however human a reaction, is a sign of a bad and unpromising student in this field. Our habits of lingering over the more desired or more pleasing things in life, when carried over into serious study, can sometimes be barriers to progress in understanding. The difference between these two approaches was borne on me one day recently in an entirely different connection. Why didn't you say? I was staying in the palace of a Middle Eastern potentate not very long ago, surrounded by every luxury. In the morning, the major domo arrived to take any orders, and I thought I would like to hear the radio, but there was not one in my apartments. I asked him to arrange it. I would like to listen to the radio, please. Of course. What programme? The early morning BBC World Service News. The following morning, two men arrived, bearing the most advanced radio receiver I had ever seen. Where would you like it set up? Right over here will do fine. One man sighted the set. The other put on headphones and located the station. He looked at his watch. Very soon he gave a signal and the radio amplifier was switched on. At full loudspeaker volume, I heard the stirring march tune identifying London, Lilibolero, then the news. When it was over, the two picked up their apparatus and silently withdrew. After breakfast, I went to pay my respects to the potentate, who asked me if all was to my liking. Yes, may your life be long. I did ask them to give me the London news, and they did, but I wished that they had left the radio so that I could listen to other programmes. My dear fellow, said the sovereign, for he had been educated in England and spoke like that, you must not blame us but rather the fact that you are spending a little too much time in the West. Why on earth didn't you tell my chaps that you only wanted to twiddle? Then they would have left it. So, if people interested in Eastern tales only want to twiddle, they should say so. They can, on the other hand, look at the intact system, whether presented as Eastern or as a psychological or educational tool. Having insisted that access to the whole range of the activity of Sufi study can only come through involvement in it, as with any other comprehensive operation, one can certainly enunciate other principles which may be of interest and of use to more generalised human areas, though I must stress that they are limited. The zoologist Dr Desmond Morris, who wrote The Naked Ape and other best-selling books on human behaviour, has noted the effect of Sufi stories on his daily life. Many of these, he states, were not appreciated by him at the time of reading, but their message and usefulness were understood when, subsequently, experiences corresponding to the structures laid down in the stories occurred in his dealings with other people. There was a framework for handling situations which he had not had before. The Tales as Structures 
Several scholars, both those specialising in the Middle East and others, have written recently that the tales, as structures which make possible the holding of certain concepts in a particular relationship, have an unusual value, sometimes in helping them to understand ranges of ideas which are not ordinarily linked in any other way. And in the scientific field, for instance, the Mullah Nasruddin stories appear in, of all things, the report of the second Coral Gables Conference on Symmetry Principles at High Energy to illustrate recondite concepts in physics. An interesting experiment is now going on showing that the usage of unfamiliar and even confusing stories and statements could be rendered in terms of one method of switching the brain's action from the sequential and logical to the simultaneous mode. In this latter area, several Sufi tales in my Tales of the Dervishes, which have no obvious point or which are susceptible to more than one interpretation, have been observed to work in this way. The bringing into greater action of the right hemisphere functions and the attenuation of the left may well be the reason for such disjointed injunctions as think of the sound of no sound. I have myself been impressed to hear a small schoolboy, faced by the flow of words of an unusually lucid and logical youth, shout suddenly at him, Go knit yourself a slice of cake. The effect was almost instantaneous, stopping the intellectual in his tracks. But it is hardly fair to use this knowledge deliberately to overcome someone else. The holistic overall mode cannot of course compete in sequential activity and seems to take over when the logical one is jammed by such statements as this. I once did this as a test when a Freudian psychiatrist was holding forth on something or other in highly respectful company, lucidly and persuasively. I said, well, all Freudians are always saying things like, we must find out whether his grandmother bit him in the womb. The poor man gasped and stammered, and all he could say was, rather weakly, but it is physically impossible for that to happen. And this drew such a roar of derision from the audience, whose brains were evidently sequentially operating, that he never regained his aplomb in their company. The Secret Protecting Itself The more recognisably Eastern mystical master type of tale has an undeniable value in placing relationships into a new perspective providing that it is employed within limits. If, for instance, these tales are read only as didactic and propagandist, designed to instill belief and create submission to the master's wisdom, they cannot be used for our teaching purposes. Consequently, they get fed into indoctrination cults, or something which has turned or will turn into such a cult. If the message that there are certain times and circumstances, certain arrangements of factors which have to be observed in order to learn the things being taught by the tradition is respected and not confused with one-upmanship, the tales can be extremely valuable. I sometimes ask myself, though, whether the phrase much used by Sufis, the secret protects itself, cannot be applied to such tales, as well as to other areas in Sufi experience for a paranoid reaction to them effectively excludes the paranoid from that which they have to convey. Such stories are not, of course, the ingenuous attempts by crude esotericists from the East to impress and intimidate inquirers, or to bend them to their will, though some could be used for this by such people. Many an instrument can be used for cruder purposes than its original function. Indeed, one purpose of this exposition of mine is to put people on their guard. Let us look at a sample of this kind of tale, with its built-in aversion therapy element, likely to annoy and deflect anyone who thinks only that he is about to be deceived. A Meaning of Silence A seeker after truth who was anxious to find a true master saved up his money and made a long journey to the dwelling place of a Sufi sage. When he was admitted to the grounds of the house, the sage met him and talked for an hour or two about generalities. Since no mystical subject was mentioned, the visitor began to feel disappointed. 
he stayed in the courtyard of the house, and some days later was admitted to the presence of the Sufi while he sat at his daily audience. The visitor addressed the sage, saying, I have come from a great distance to inquire as to what might be the mark of a real master, so that I might adopt such a one, should I ever find him. The Sufi gave him no answer at all. When the assembly broke up at nightfall, the seeker went to his lodging. Here he found that another visitor was present, and he mentioned the matter to him. Your disappointment, which is with the sage, should be with yourself for failing to understand him, said the other. When he talked generalities to you, he was saying that you were still fit only for generalities, and should not try to converse on any higher subject until a master initiated such converse. When, in the assembly, you received only silence to your question, you were being shown that the mark of a real master is to be able not to answer questions put by people who are not able to make good use of an answer already given them. Since I started to publish these stories in 1964, and with an ever-increasing volume of letters, cablegrams and telephone calls which is quite astonishing, people have been showing the greatest possible interest in them. The most frequent question is, how can I use teaching stories? And a close second is the remark, I get no spiritual sensations from them. Now the answer to these questions is really very simple, and I have often been able to get people to produce the answer themselves by throwing the question right back at them, asking them to question their assumptions. This technique, of course, is also advocated in dozens of the published tales themselves. Then, on reflection, they answer, of course, things like, Perhaps I have to know more before I can use them. And, Spirituality to me may mean something which gives me a certain kind of emotional sensation linked with specific images. So I may have to perceive what it really is. A Different Kind of Disciple One of the specialities of the Sufis is to approach the same thing the needs of the student, from many different directions, so that by what we call scatter, a constellation of impacts, the picture ultimately comes together and he understands. Another story might make this versatility and undogmatic approach clearer. There was once a Sufi teacher who dressed his disciples in robes of wool, had them carry begging bowls made of sea coconuts, taught them to whirl in a mystic dance, and in tone passages from certain classics. A philosopher asked him, What would you do, as a Sufi teacher, if you went to a country where there were no sheep for the wool, where sea coconuts were unknown, where dancing was considered immoral, and where you were not allowed to teach classics? He immediately answered, I would find, in such a place, a quite different kind of disciple. It is, in the Sufi area, the possibility of oneself becoming a quite different kind of disciple, learner or teacher, free from the tyranny of instruments, externals and dogma, which is predicated in the contention that all secondary ideas and things, among the Sufis, exist only to be dispensed within higher ranges of education, and preferably as soon as possible. Quite obviously, in any community, there are many people who only obtain their sense of identity from such externals and appurtenances. They will not be attracted to the greater and most effective depths of teaching stories. In fact, some are actually almost terrified by them. Teaching stories have been described to me, despairingly, as one long series of testing devices, which is only a little more useful than the phrase that Life is only one damn thing after another. However true it may be, is that all that can be seen by such an observer? Very possibly. Teaching stories, I am sure, annoy people because they will say again and again that you cannot treat measles by painting out the spots. The testing function. And the testing function is certainly there. The chief feature of this testing, however, is to illustrate to the person himself what some of his major characteristics of thought are, 
so that he may modify them or be able to detach from them, instead of being their slave. Observing each other's reactions, too, can help a class to widen their perception of the tales. One such story, The Tale of the Sands, sometimes shows people their own dependency situation, quite dramatically. In this tale, the river, aware of its existence, runs towards the sea, but arrives before that at a stretch of sand and starts to run away into nothingness, to become, at best, a marsh. Terrified of losing its identity, but with no real alternative, the river allows itself to be lifted up by the wind, though only after much debate and soul-searching. The wind carries it out of danger and allows it to fall as water, safely as it precipitates against a mountain at the other side. Some people love this story. For others, it has the awful quality of reminding them that they must die or that they may be being asked to choose someone or something of whom or of which they know next to nothing, of a different kind from themselves, to submit to this and to be carried away to somewhere or something of which they have no knowledge or guarantee. Do these two reactions describe the story or the people who are commenting on it? People exposed to this story can learn a lot about themselves just by testing its effect upon their feelings. Rather, as it were, like a radioactive tracer in the bloodstream, you can observe the effect of these stories as they work their way through the culture. Human reactions to them are so varied and so indicative of the major preoccupations of those reacting that there is such a great deal of useful instruction in how people behave to be gained just by monitoring what the story's fate has been over a period of a decade. Brainstorming sessions have been called to crack the codes of their meaning. Papers have been written on their origins and derivatives. Middle Eastern publishers have been affronted that I could make what they imagine must be a good living by publishing futile tales from villages in backward areas. Some self-styled Sufis have claimed that they knew all about them all the time, but wanted to use more effective means, while others of the same kidney have started to teach them themselves, saying to any inquirer that they had just been waiting to get around to them. And some, of course, have been setting them as exercises to their students, teasing out strange supposed meanings, or saying that one must not look for any meaning at all. Nazruddin. The stories seem to have a magic which makes people reveal their true selves, one constantly feels, and they make a lot of things out of the academic world work. One scholar has told everyone who had listened that I had invented the esoteric qualities ascribed to the Mullah Nazruddin corpus. When he was told that there was an article about this by a Westerner who had studied these matters actually in the East, he instantly replied that I must have written the article myself. I am wondering what he will say when he learns that one of the earliest translations of Nazruddin in English, over a century old, speaks of this esoteric quality of what later became thought of merely as a joke figure. He will no doubt think that I am a reincarnation of the translator of that time. Putting in and taking out what tends to make a fruitful approach to the tales difficult currently in the West is that the very tendencies which they are trying to describe are sometimes increased by the stories themselves. There is the same problem in the East, of course. I have heard at least 20 versions of one quip about this very subject, which goes something like this. An impatient student approached a Sufi and asked him, at what point will I be able to extract the meaning and make use of the content of the stories really effectively? The sage gave a great sigh and answered, At the exact point when you stop asking when you will get to that point, and put something into your study, instead of constantly trying to get something out. The legends which surround teaching tales are, of course, numerous, even magical. It is widely believed, for instance, that people who repeat the tale of Mushkal Gusha, which I have published in Caravan of Dreams, will attract the help of the mysterious personage Mushkal Gusha, the remover of all difficulties. 
the Nazruddin tales are under a benevolent spell. It is said that whenever one of his tales is recited, seven more will have to be repeated, because as a schoolboy he was so addicted to stories and his teacher put this hex on him. My sister Amina Shah has recently republished the famous Sufi book The Tale of the Four Dervishes in English. The legend which goes with this book is that a Sufi master placed the benediction upon it which makes its reciting a miraculous healing procedure. But for the most part, luckily, the story form has made the tales most usually seen as entertainment or to be understood on their lowest level as moral warnings. This has prevented too much mumbo-jumbo from coalescing around them. Minor advantages have also been spontaneously observed. When I did a documentary programme for British television, I told a group of children a tale which is familiar in Central Asia and which we used in England as part of the teaching in the children's school at our house. The Lion Who Saw His Face in the Water There was once a lion who lived in a desert which was very windy, and because of this the water in the holes from which he usually drank was never still, for the wind riffled the surface and never reflected anything. One day, this lion wandered into a forest, where he hunted and played, until he felt rather tired and thirsty. Looking for water, he came across a pool of the coolest, most tempting, and most placid water that you could possibly imagine. Lions, like other wild animals, can smell water, and the scent of this water was like ambrosia to him. So the lion approached the pool and extended his neck to have a good drink. Suddenly, though, he saw his reflection and imagined that it must be another lion. Oh dear, he thought to himself, this must be water belonging to another lion. I had better be careful. He retreated, but then thirst drove him back again, and again he saw the head of a fearsome lion looking back at him from the surface of the pool. This time our lion hoped that he might be able to frighten the other lion away and so he opened his mouth and gave a terrible roar. But no sooner had he bared his teeth than, of course, the mouth of the other lion opened as well, and this seemed to our lion to be an awful and dangerous sight. Again and again the lion retreated and then returned to the pool. Again and again he had the same experience. After a long time, however, he was so thirsty and desperate that he decided to himself, Lion or no lion, I am going to drink from that pool. And lo and behold, no sooner had he plunged his face into the water than the other lion disappeared. There was no special intention of spreading this story as a psychological support or therapeutic tool for parents with fearful children. But I got a good many letters after the TV film was shown saying how parents had been able to use the story to reassure various youngsters who had fears of the unknown or of unfamiliar situations. It is true that these tales are told to children in the East, instead of the more gruesome ones which are often found in Hans Andersen and the Brothers Grimm, and no doubt there is a gap which could be filled here. They would be useful for children and certainly entertain them, as we have found for many years. They are less attractive to many adults, as has been proved by the fact that the people who choose books for children, that is, adult publishers' readers, have universally turned them down as unsuitable or uninteresting, though, as one has kindly said, admittedly curious. The stories have become something of a rage in schools, and partly through BBC educational broadcasting, where they are constantly used and widely discussed laying down a stratum of interest which results in constant enquiries and callers from all over the place. No account of teaching stories can be really useful unless there has been a recital of some of these tales without any explanation at all. This is because some of the effect can be prevented by an interpretation, and the difference between an exposition and a teaching event is precisely that in the latter nobody knows what his or her reaction is supposed to be from any doctrinal standpoint, so that there can be a private reaction and a personal absorption of the materials. So let us look at one or two of the tales now 
under conditions of no explanation, so that we can observe our own reactions. Panacea There are colonies of dervishes, random and not well-informed seekers, who carry out rhythmic exercises which sometimes produce mental states that they regard, in the early stages of their experimentation, as divine illumination. Quite a lot of ordinary people, too, are attracted by this. They imagine, quite wrongly, that all dervishes are illuminated and respect them. One day, it is related, a well-meaning but ignorant seeker after truth arrived at the encampment of a group of these weirdly dressed dervishes, one of whose number was lying on the ground with his eyeballs rolled up in an attitude of complete surrender, on his back the very picture of total relaxation. I have come to share your life and experience your experiences, said the man eagerly to the chief of the dervishes. What would you like to share with us? asked the chief. Allow me to share the condition and state of that recumbent dervish, requested the visitor. With their customary hospitality, the dervishes obliged. Forming a ring around their new friend, they helped a scorpion to sting him. Admit one. A dervish died and was being questioned by the two angels who stand guard over the gates of paradise. Why should you be admitted here? When I was on earth, I was a follower of the great teacher Gilani. Enter. His place was taken by the next man, who was asked the same question. I must certainly be allowed in, for I have heard what you said to the man in front of me, and I was the follower at the very same time of three of the greatest teachers. The angels barred his way. No, you will not be allowed to enter. But why not? Do you think that we admit people who don't know their own minds? Moths A Sufi once established himself at a crossroads. At night he set up a very bright lamp. Not far away he lit a candle. Beside the candle he sat and read his books. There must be some secret wisdom in this, the people of a nearby town said to one another, but they could not fathom the language of the demonstration, if such it was, nor could they penetrate the mystery of the teaching which was being offered them. At last a group of curious citizens, unable to restrain themselves any longer, sent a deputation to ask why the Sufi had two forms of illumination and why he had placed them in such a manner. Look, he said, at the lamp. It is surrounded every night by thousands of moths. By providing that light for moths, I am left in peace by them, to read by my candle. I please the moths, and keep them away from me. Thus it is with humanity. If everyone knew where real knowledge was, life would be chaos. As it is, people even become frenzied whenever they imagine, like the moths, that there is something which they should surround, especially if that thing is attractive to them. Reserved There was once a pretended Sufi who had attracted a fair number of disciples, but he was nothing like as successful as a genuine teacher who lived in the next town. He made up his mind to find out what the secret formula of the real Sufi was. Disguising himself, he asked for an audience and also to be enrolled as a disciple. The Sufi took him in and said, The one and only secret for you is that you make a mixture of sugar and water and lie out in the open air without moving, smeared with it for several hours a day. Then you will attain to the adequate truth. The imposter went back to his own headquarters and told all his followers to use the sugar and water exercise. Insects descended in swarms on all of them, and all the disciples abandoned him. 
Eventually, lonely and eaten up with curiosity, he returned to the Sufi. I come to you, I now confess, to learn your secret. But when I gave your exercise to my disciples, they were plagued by hornets and they all deserted me, he said. That's how it should have been, said the Sufi. The idea was that your disciples should be driven away from the imposter and that you would be driven to the stage of desperation and focus upon a single problem from which alone you can really learn. What to see A party of pilgrims were sitting in the presence of a great spiritual teacher when he stood up and dramatically pointed at one of them. Immediately the man fell down in an ecstasy. When they all got back to their rest house, this man became impatient while they were excitedly discussing the miracle of the instant illumination. What about me? he demanded. After all, it was me he did it to. The leader of the group looked at him with disgust. You seem to forget, he said, that we came to see him, the great man, doing the illuminating, not to see you being illuminated. Sure Remedy A man went to visit his physician. My trouble is, he told him, that I fall asleep during the very long lectures given by my spiritual guide. The doctor handed him a bottle of pills. One, three times a day, he said. Oh, thank you, doctor. Do I take them with water? No, you don't take them. In his food, you fool. Unanimous Two would-be disciples met after having visited a certain sage. I have decided, after listening to that man, said the first, that he lacks the spiritual insights which I previously hoped would characterise him. Yes, agreed the second seeker after truth. He wouldn't take me on either. Educating through the teaching story follows many of the patterns in other kinds of instruction. For example, there will always be some people, very few, in any community, who will be able to understand the whole body of teaching material without any instruction, without the benefit of any specialised institution to impart this knowledge to people in measured and appropriate stages. You might guess how many people would be able to do this if you were to ask yourself, as a rough analogy, how many people in a country without, say, mathematics or poetry would be able to understand the whole of such an art or science just by immersing themselves in poetry or mathematics? From our standpoint, therefore, the question is entirely hypothetical. Besides, it might be noted, why would anyone want to reinvent mathematics? Have you enough time, apart from capacity? For what we call education, teaching and learning, there have to be teachers, materials and learners, and these have to be in a certain kind of alignment or relationship for the optimum results to be obtained. We can prepare the climate, introduce ideas and indicate some usages of teaching stories in an introduction such as this. Mentioning the unfamiliarity of the concept of stories, quoting some as illustrations as part of the process, referring to how people have reacted and continue to react to them, showing barriers to using them and contending that they are indeed highly sophisticated teaching frames. This is what we have been doing, as a sort of gallop around some of the more easily noted relatively exterior features of this really intricate matter. But there is no instant application of the stories as a sort of magic wand, or even as some kind of band-aid dressing. The stories, as a body, and correctly used, offer a remarkable way into another way of thinking and of being. If they are considered only as individual items which can be adopted to add to a repertory, or for any other instantly obvious purpose, they are not much more useful than almost any other literary form intelligently used. The whole, holistic, if you like, body of material and its operation is being introduced now. I would ask you not to be satisfied with imitations. These, as I am sure you already know, 
are characterized by crypticism on the one hand and telling you what you want to hear on the other. No form of education I know about does that, but cults do. I can do no better than to quote at this point Rumi, one of our great masters. You may have a magic ring, but you must be a Solomon, master of invisible powers, to make it work. <laughs>